All right, good morning and good afternoon. Welcome. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for our presentation today, Securing Data in the Cloud, the Blueprint for PCI Compliance. My name is Melanie, and I'm the Director of Demand Generation for Snowflake, and I will be today's moderator. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsor and our partner in Security Align, a nationwide security and compliance solutions provider specializing in helping businesses across a variety of industries navigate the complexities of their specific audit and security assessment needs. And hosting today's event is Snowflake Computing. And Snowflake provides the only data warehouse built for the cloud, one designed to deliver the performance, simplicity, concurrency, uh, all needed to solve today's data and analytics challenges. Snowflake and Align have worked together to ensure that Snowflake's cloud data warehousing solution delivers robust security. And today we'll be sharing more about our approach and best practices. Today's presentation is going to be largely conversational and will focus on four main topics, which include description of cloud versus on-premises compliance, We'll be outlining some key questions to answer, uh, questions to consider when using SAS, and we'll go into some roles and responsibilities. And before we begin, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping items. Each uh, attendee is going to be on mute. So we'll ask uh, for you to also engage with us through our Q&A widget. Um, and we'll be taking questions through the webinar platform. You'll see the Q&A widget along the bottom there. And we'll be taking as many questions as possible. And if we don't address your question, we'll be sure to follow up with you individually. Uh, at the end of our presentation, you'll see a slide with our presenter's contact information. And uh, this presentation will be being recorded and will be available following the presentation. We'll be sending you the recording at the end of the week. Um, also, just a, a note, we have some great resources available um, that you'll see along the platform. So please feel free to download and, and visit the resources tab. Um, so right now, let's dive in. I'd like to welcome today's presenters, Dustin Rich, uh, Managing Consultant with Align. Dustin has performed uh, and managed hundreds of PCI DSS assessments over the past nine years. As an IT professional with over 18 years of IT experience, Dustin has the technical background and experience to manage large, complex IT environments. Dustin has worked with Fortune 500 companies, large retail environments, higher education, independent sales organizations, ISO, payment gateways, and merchants and issuing banks. Welcome, Dustin, and welcome to Susan Walsh. Susan is a security and privacy advocate with Snowflake. Susan is a CISSP with over 15 years in SaaS operations, security and risk management, and she currently works at Snowflake as our security and privacy advocate. That means she gets to manage all audits for Snowflake, including SOC 2, Type 2, HIPAA, PCI DSS, and FedRAMP. And you might just meet her if you're a customer or prospect evaluating Snowflake security. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I am going to pass the presentation over to Dustin from Align. Dustin, take it away. All right, Melanie, thank you. I, I appreciate that introduction. I thank you for this opportunity to, to present with Snowflake. So to begin, I, I thought I would start um, by quickly reviewing what actually is cloud services? Uh, one thing I, I've noticed over the past several years is that everyone is wanting to use this term cloud. I'm seeing it late, this label being slapped on just about onto everything, um, from web hosting to, uh, I don't know if you remember, going back to the late 90s, the ASP, application service providers, uh, um, all these are now using the term cloud uh, to describe themselves. Uh, virtual infrastructure providers, are, are use, use the term cloud and, and actual application vendors are using it as well. So, so everyone is using this term 
and, and what does it actually mean? So, uh, and, and the fact that uh, they're using this, none, none of them, uh, these different providers and, and types of solutions are, are really, none of them are u using it incorrectly um, because cloud really doesn't have any specific set of criteria. Uh, it has a very liberal definition and can be potentially slapped on anything hosted on the web, and that's what we're seeing out there. Uh, this includes uh, infra infrastructure as a service um, providers, uh, which could be public or private. Uh, there is also platform as a service that we see out there, software as a service providers, and now we're hearing this new category, it's being called function as a service. Um, and we'll, we'll quickly, uh, I'll quickly give an explanation of each of these different types. So an infrastructure as a service, this is the, the most basic cloud service that provides a customer, a managed virtualized computing infrastructure. Uh, these, these are providers managing the, the virtual infrastructure, so the hypervisor and provides their customers VMs to host their applications. So customers generally fully manage their VMs in this type of environment um, or their virtual appliances in this environment. Um, it, and so that's, that's basically what infrastructure as a service is. It gives you the infrastructure and the ability, similar to what you would have if you had physical systems, but in a logical sense. Um, and you are pretty much responsible for managing those VMs in that environment. So platform as a service, now this is closely related to infrastructure as a service, with the exception it provides additional tools and services. So typically you'll see development tools, database tools, tools for networking and analytics built into this model. Uh, the platform as a service model will also typically support the underlying OS of your VMs. So this helps customers to, to focus more on the management of the application environment and, and not having to spend as much time dealing with the, with things like licensing and be able to to scale more quickly within your environment. Um, software as a service. Now that this goes a step further than platform as a service by actually hosting and managing the applications you are running. Uh, this leaves you with with just managing the actual configuration and settings of an application, and not on the actual implementation and support of the application. Uh, software as a service provider uh, is often uh, the ap actual application vendor in many cases and will will often provide the application to its customers under a monthly subscription fee, which helps the customer with not having to deal with the headaches of these older licensing, licensing fee structures. Um, so we see a lot of that now out there today. Now there's a, a new term we hear popping up more frequently now, and that's function as a service. So, and what is that? So, so this is fairly cutting edge, and, and it's quickly becoming more visible out there as a service offering. Function as a service has some similarities to, it's tied to platform as a service, but it's, it's more like platform as a service on steroids. And functions more, um, it's what is called service, serverless architecture. Uh, there are no servers for you to manage in, in that type of environment. It provides a platform uh, allowing customers to develop, run, and manage application functionality without any infrastructure to maintain. It's most often used by, by those building microservices applications. Uh, examples of this include uh, out there, there's AWS Lambda, Hook.io, and Microsoft Azure Functions um, that are providing services using this model. And, and pricing for this type of service is based off the actual execution time of the service, uh, so what, you, what the application actually uses. Um, so, so, so this is a lot of information. And wh why is understanding all of this important to you? Um, having, having an understanding uh, of the service you're utilizing is, is vital. It's important because ultimately you need to understand how the service you are using affects security, of your environment and your data. You need to understand what your service provider is providing you and what you are ultimately responsible for. Ultimately, if you outsource to a, to a third party to manage um, for the management of your infrastructure uh, man, or management of your software, you, you are still liable uh, to ensure they are managing it securely and correctly. The requirements are the same for an in-house premise infrastructure as it is for an infrastructure built in the cloud. Uh, it's important 
uh, for you to understand that and how the cloud service provider is actually addressing each of the requirements for you. Uh, also, many organizations have incorrect assumptions that because they, they use a service provider that is compliant, that the service provider is addressing all of their organization's compliance responsibilities. Uh, that, that is rarely the case, if ever. And, and there is almost always some form of compliance responsibility that remain for any organization that outsources. So please uh, do your due diligence. Right. I think all of that is really super relevant, Dustin, because it's critical for as a, a consumer, right, as you're evaluating your software vendor or your cloud vendor, you want to understand what are these different components that they use? What are the underlying uh, components that they depend on and how have they vetted those vendors? So the cloud is a pretty complicated place before, right, before you start to dive into it. And then once you do dive in, you start to do some blocking and tackling, which is what we're going to try to do here for you. So um, I'm going to the next slide, which is key questions to answer. These are some of the questions that I get uh, whenever I'm doing um, an evaluation of our software vendors. So of course, Snowflake uses software vendors and, and service providers for our business needs, and that's part of my role as well. So one of the questions that I always get when I'm evaluating a vendor is, well, if my infrastructure is compliant, I run on Azure, I run on AWS, and they're PCI compliant, why does my application need to be compliant? So I walk them through why that's important. Another question is, what does the infrastructure provider do versus what the software as a solution or cloud provider does? And then what does the customer do? And next, what is the most important thing for me to do as a customer, which we will also be digging into a little bit more detail a little bit later in the presentation. But going back to that first question, Dustin, I'd like to know from your perspective as a QSA, what do you see um, as the most important aspect when, when the infrastructure is compliant? Why does a vendor or a customer have to worry about the application on top of that? Yeah, Susan, that's a really good question. Uh, so it's it's good to realize or to understand that, and we kind of went through this on the previous slide, that not all cloud services are the same. They're all different. And uh, just like the term cloud can mean di many different things, compliance in the cloud can likewise mean many different things. If a server service provider says they are compliant, uh, what requirements are they actually compliant to and what services were included as part of their review. Uh, this, these are the questions you should be asking. If using any cloud or, or managed service provider, uh, determining compliance is just the first step. The next step is determining what they are specifically compliant to, what have they stated they are responsible for, and what responsibilities remain that you still need to address. Uh, this, this is really important to understand, particularly when it comes to a managed service provider or, or a cloud service provider. Uh, these are, this is all very applicable. So remember the different definitions of uh, infrastructure or platform as a service that we talked about. Well, some of the platform as a service providers, they, they could include management of your IDS, uh, provide you log centralization and log reviews, and even provide you vulnerability scans. Um, but, but other providers out there they just might be providing a compliant virtualized infrastructure requiring you to implement all these controls and manage all the compliance controls and requirements within that environment. So it's really important for you to really dive in and understand um, what, what the provider is providing, what they're stating they're responsible for, and addressing on your behalf, and ensuring you're meeting everything outside of that, and also ensuring they, they are actually following through and in addressing those controls correctly. So, so to help with this, um, many service providers will provide what is referred to as a responsibility matrix. Uh, and, and we encourage you to ask your provider for this type of documentation. Not all of them will have it, but when it comes to cloud environments, it's, it's something I think that's very vital. And most cloud service providers should be providing you this level of documentation. And, and you need to verify that what they are addressing and that, that 
that it applies to the specific type of service you utilize. If it's infrastructure as a service or a platform as a service or software as a service, um, it should distinctly spell out the service you are you are utilizing and that it was included as part of the service or, or their assessment. Uh, many providers uh, provide multiple services, so ensure that this matrix they provide you is specific to the type of service you utilize, and they may have different uh, responsibility matrix based off the different services. So make sure you get the correct one that addresses what you have, and that way you can ensure you're addressing all the required controls. Right. We depend heavily on that PCI responsibility matrix ourselves when we're evaluating other vendors. And also, we use our, from a Snowflake perspective, we leverage that heavily when we're trying to help our customers understand what they need to do in order to be PCI compliant on the Snowflake environment. So um, some of the specifics that come to mind are, for example, making sure you understand encryption and key management. Who is actually doing the encryption? Is it enabled by default? Who is managing the encryption keys? How are they rotated? How is information re-keyed? Do you have to take the environment offline to do that? What's the downtime? What's the performance implication? Mm -hmm. In addition to that, vulnerability and patch management, which is a huge headache. Anyone that's been in an IT or operations organization knows that going through, identifying the issues, understanding how they apply to your environment, evaluating them, going through the testing process, and then rolling them out to production is a pretty expensive, time-consuming process that you'd rather be spending working on something else more, uh, more sexy, if you will. So that aspect, a lot of uh, service providers, cloud service providers will provide for you, but you want to make sure that they're doing it diligently because if they're not, if they can't prove to you that they are actually executing on their vulnerability and patch management process, then you are left open to risks uh, inherently because you're using their platform or their software. Another example is penetration testing and remediation. So penetration testing can help with, uh, sure, vulnerability and patch management will help you address the security vulnerabilities that are already known, but what about those that aren't known? What about those that maybe there's a back door that somebody forgot? Or the penetration testing and remediation process is also critical to, to ensure that the whole environment that you're working with, that you're going to be depending on, is secure. And remediation means documenting each of the findings and, and closing them out, tracking them to closure, and making sure that they've been tested uh, as well. So another example, too, is the ability to manage your own users. And we'll talk about that, uh, I think, a little bit later, to manage authorization. And then the ability to actually see who has access to what without requiring DBA access. So these are some of the important questions. And then, of course, the third question is, if, 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 if it's, it's still ambiguous, right? There's, there's still some ambiguity between, especially when it comes to user management, uh, what does your service provider do versus what you do and what's enabled by default. So the last question is, what is the most important thing for me to do as a customer? So segueing to the next slide, some of the things that you want to consider when using a cloud provider, regardless of whether or not it's an infrastructure provider or a platform provider or a software as a service provider, you want to know where your data is. How is it traversing from your environment all the way through theirs, and is it encrypted properly? You'll need to classify your data to make sure that you understand what is the data that needs to be encrypted in order for you to be able to determine whether or not it actually is encrypted. And how is that data accessed? Is it accessed through an API? Is it accessed directly through SQL? If it's an API, that needs to be tested as well. You need to perform security testing on that. Not you necessarily, but you, your vendor needs to prove that they have done their due diligence on any interface that they share with you that is an entry point for access to your data. And then lastly, there's replication and backup, which is a really important piece of uh, 
uh, it's an important requirement, really. I was going to say piece of functionality, but it's truly a requirement. You need to make sure that you have backups of your data for forensic purposes at least, but practically speaking as well. So when you do backups, who has access to that? Do you have access to that or do you have to call your vendor to be able to restore that? If you have to call your vendor, who at your vendor site has access to that information? That's, your, that's the keys to the kingdom. That's your precious data. You want to make sure you understand who from your customer site has access to that too. I'm sorry, who from your vendor site has access to your backups and, of course, are your backups encrypted? So similar to that, the next bullet on here, this is kind of a wordy slide, but um, can your cloud provider access your data? And if they can access your unencrypted data, how do, they, how do they handle their access controls? That's really important. They should be adhering to the same diligent procedures that you do for your data access at your site. So do they implement least privilege? Do they have separation of duties? Do they have personnel policies for users with privileged access? Do they go through security awareness training? Do they uh, have background checks, for example? All of these things are very important to consider, and that information should be included in, um, in the reports that they provide to you. As far as application security, if you are working with a vendor who's providing um, functionality for you, software as a service or any kind of application for that matter, even just a driver or an ODBC layer uh, access point, how secure is their application? Do they have a secure data, I'm sorry, secure development lifecycle program? And does it include change management? Do changes have to be documented and approved? Are code reviews? Uh, required for every production change. And also, for major pieces of functionality, do they do application security testing? And last but not least, of course, is how secure is the overall ecosystem? Is the overall system tested, whether that's with automated penetration testing or vulnerability scanning or manual penetration testing with a purple team, for example? That's very important. And then logging and monitoring is also a key point to bring up with your vendor to make sure that you, the, really, to make sure that they understand exactly what they should be monitoring and that it's the right things to satisfy your requirements. And just because they're monitoring it doesn't mean that they are actually following up on the events. We know with Target, there was monitoring going on but they fell down in uh, they fell down in multiple ways. But one of the ways that they fell down in was with their incident response process. They didn't properly triage the problem to identify what was going on. So, um, Dustin, I'm sure that you have other things to add or emphasize from an auditor's perspective. You've seen a lot more than I have. What are your thoughts on on what to consider when evaluating yeah. yes. a provider? So so, Susan, you make, you make a lot of good points there, and there's a lot you covered there. And, and I can tell you from, from a cloud perspective, um, we often see customers struggle with the understanding of, like, pen test scoping and applicability uh, for their given service, and also with understanding things that you mentioned related to data storage and the security controls for the persistently stored data within that environment. Uh, having an understanding of, of what your provider has access to is really important. And you made a really good point about that. Uh, do, can they access your data? Uh, how, how do they control this access internally? And, and how do they have, or do they have access to your actual keys to decrypt that data? Those are questions I'd want to ask. They're all really important points. Uh, also, logging is an area that you touched on. And one point I'll make on that is if your provider states they are responsible for all log reviews and responsible for, for uh, responding to logs, log events, uh, can, they, can they really effectively do this? Are you, you as a customer ever notified if critical events occur? Uh, are there specific types of events you should be notified about? If so, what, what are the escalation procedures related to this? Do they know who to contact? Uh, who do they notify? So these are topics you should be considering when re reviewing your, your service provider environment and ensuring that you have proper uh, 
controls to meet the requirements in place. Right. All right. Thanks, Susan. Yep. Yeah. Um, so the next slide talks a little bit about that, about, for example, some of the roles and responsibilities divided into categories. This is a super high level, obviously. It's quite an oversimplification, but I wanted to put it in here just to give you at a high level a way to look at, uh, and I'm not a graphics person, so there's probably a much better way to represent this, but the gist of it is that your infrastructure as a service provider, their core competency, what they're bringing to the table for you is their physical security and their virtualized infrastructure. Those are hugely valuable to you, but there's a lot that they don't provide, which is at the next level. If you're working with a software as a service provider or even a platform as a service provider, you need to make sure that they understand the firewall management and that they're, they've implemented it appropriately. That's something that your PCI auditor, for example, will verify uh, in significant detail, I might add. Um, so in addition to that, there's the vulnerability management process that I discussed before. Your SAS provider is responsible for identifying the security patches that need to be applied, and they're responsible for applying them. And then there's encryption. Is encryption enabled by default? Who does the encryption? Do you have to do the encryption? If your software as a service provider is providing you with software, you'd hope that they would be encrypting the data. As I go through my audits of some of the vendors that my um, colleagues identify as possible solutions to, to help us be more efficient here from a business perspective at Snowflake, I find that companies are not encrypting as much of the data as I would want them to, and we need to move on to look at a different vendor. And then, of course, there's the SaaS provider's personnel or the cloud provider's personnel. You want to make sure, again, that they've gone through the appropriate background checks and security awareness training and that they get quarterly training to refresh their memories on what is a phishing attack. They are increasingly prevalent. There's such an easy way to get, you know, even for opportunists, but especially for nation states to get really useful information. Um, so making sure that your, your, uh, your employees, your staff members are properly trained is absolutely critical these days. And then your software as a service provider should be providing you with easy access management, um, not just from a technical perspective for you to have credentials and the credentials are encrypted, but also how do you create users or do they have to create them for you, et cetera. And then, of course, there's user audit. From a PCI compliance perspective, you have to be able to audit who has access to your data, what they accessed, and when. So making sure that your SaaS provider audits their, their staff members' movements right through that production environment, through the, the in-scope hard data environment. Um, and then also, how do you audit your own users' access? Do they provide the ability to, to uh, let you have that visibility? And then what is the customer responsible for? Obviously, other than making sure that your vendor does all of these things, what do you have to do? Well, everything outside the boundary of the infrastructure or software as a service vendor. Anything that they don't explicitly address that's required for PCI compliance, you need to make sure you are addressing. And also, if they provide functionality, for example, encryption, you need to make sure that that is enabled for your specific environment. And that's another critical piece. In some cases, vendors may charge extra for an environment uh, in order to enable encryption, for example. So um, it could be a lot, really, that the customer is responsible for. So if we go to the next slide, we go into just a little bit more detail here. Um, Key customer responsibilities are always endpoint protection. If you've got users at your site who are using devices issued by the company or even not issued by the company, if they are using those devices to access the PCI environment, they need to adhere to the appropriate device security hardening uh, requirements that your, your organization has defined. So ensuring endpoint protection is critical for your users. 
Also, end user education, as I mentioned before, you're responsible for the education of your end users. That's not necessarily going to change, um, regardless of who your cloud provider is. And then protection of the data when it leaves the SaaS environment. So great, you know, Snowflake secures your data, but if somebody downloads that data or even before they send it to Snowflake, if they're not handling it securely, obviously that's uh, an area of responsibility for you as the customer. So then what are some of the overlapping areas? Well, control over user accounts and credentials is really important. How does your vendor help you? manage user accounts? Do they make it easy for you to create users? Do they allow the functionality for role-based or even uh, discretionary access controls? Um, it's important when you go through and you understand, of course, your own access control requirements to make sure that your vendor maps to be able to satisfy your requirements as well. So uh, it's not always at the level of granularity that you might want. For example, do they restrict view, but anybody who can view can also modify? Anybody who can view and modify can also delete? How granular is the restriction for your, uh, your users, your ability to configure that and customize it? And then, of course, there's access and authorization as far as supporting multi-factor authentication, single sign-on, and IP whitelisting. These are all tools that your vendor should provide in order to allow you to, uh, to restrict access even further um, from your end users. And then last, but I can't I always say not least, right, being able to access whoever is using your environment. Um, again, it's an important requirement um, to be able to understand and have access to your own audit logs to see who from your organization has been accessing what data. Um, so those are the key customer responsibilities that I can think of, but Dustin, again, from your perspective as a QSA, I know you have much broader experience. What are some of the customer responsibilities that you see that might cause challenges for the customer or that they may need to pay closer attention to? So, so again, the type of service you are utilizing will, will have a significant effect on, on what the customer will be responsible for and what they'll they'll be dealing with. Um, so, a, so a software as a service provider, of course, will will take take on more responsibility and take ownership of more requirements that, than an infrastructure as a service provider. Uh, but even if using, let's say, a software as a service provider, things you will want to re to review with them um, will include. The, and some of this we, we talked about previously, but include the log requirements. Are they being addressed? Are there escalation procedures required? Um, review the pen test scoping. Uh, are all the required application and network layer testing being performed, both internally and externally? Are they leaving application testing to, to the customer? Um, those type of questions will need to be answered. Uh, vulner vulnerability scanning. It is another area that sometimes is a challenge. Um, external ASV scanning and internal scanning is required. Are, are they requiring you as the customer to do your own ASV scanning, or will they be providing that uh, for you? Um, and and if, you're, if you're controlling any code, I would assume that there's got to be some communication there with scanning. So if there's things that need to be corrected, uh, you have a, a communication channel to get those addressed in a timely manner. Also, how are how are you or your provider addressing, uh, let's say, the application scanning or web application firewall requirements in the environment? Uh, that's that's often a, a challenge in, in the cloud, and uh, and determining how that's being addressed will be really important. Uh, these are just a few of the areas you, you want to ensure are addressed by either you or your service provider, and you want to be confident that the controls are are effective and, and being applied correctly as well. Remember, when, when you outsource to a third party, you, you may be transferring some of the risks, but, but not necessarily all the liability. You are responsible to make sure your service provider and your organization is addressing all the required controls. So fully vet your service provider. 
the, the cloud service providers like AWS, they have many tools that can help you with PCI DSS, uh, and, and that list keeps growing. Uh, there are tools and services that could be leveraged to help organizations with many of the compliance challenges. It can help you grow and scale more, more effectively. The problem is, however, is that many of these services require a level of expertise and knowledge to effectively utilize and to manage. Uh, so there's, there's a reason AWS out there has, or has all these certifications out there. Um, the most recent one I've seen is the AWS Big Data certification. These, these environments are becoming more and more complex and requires a level of expertise to take full advantage of what they have to offer. So utilizing um, services from a, a, let's say a software as a service provider that takes on more of this responsibility, um, that can be beneficial and, and they generally, uh, and, and I, I don't wanna say they all have, this is what, why you need to fully vet, but uh, they, they generally will have the expertise to fully manage and configure these tools um, and it can be very beneficial to organizations that would otherwise struggle to implement and support um, the controls within the cloud environments, such as all these service offerings that AWS offers. But again, you, you want to make sure you are confident that the provider is doing the, the, everything they're promising to do correctly. So yes, get their compliance validation evidence that we talked about and, and information from their responsibility matrix, but just just don't uh, go through the motion uh, and, and use this compliance validation evidence as your checkbox for vendor management. You should feel comfortable and confident that your service provider is doing what they are promising to do. You should feel confident that they have the level of expertise to properly secure and protect your data. Again, you are ultimately responsible for, for the service provider, so, so hold them accountable. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, um, so that's great. Um, I think we were going to, that was the end of our formal content. Yeah, it, it is, and thank you so much, Dustin and Susan. So before we get into our Q&A session, I'd, I'd like to kind of leave uh, the formal presentation with some final thoughts and then really leave our audience with some sub substance, uh, substantive thoughts uh, on what they can um, kind of take with them through this presentation. And Susan, if you want to um, kind of piggyback on what Dustin was saying or, yeah. or get into some of your final thoughts just from our conversation today. Yeah, exactly. Actually, you know, as Dustin was talking, I was thinking about the fact that I love working with vendors who are more partners with me and my organization. Um, I really appreciate transparency when organizations are willing to share with me, even if they don't have perfect documentation, if they're willing to share with me additional information to substantiate the, uh, the actual procedures that they're following, I find that very valuable. So asking your customers, like if I were to give you some takeaways, your, not your customers, but your vendors, Make sure that you feel like they are not withholding information. It shouldn't be painful to get information out of them. They should be transparent. It should be a partnership. When you ask them for the SOC 2 Type 2 report, for example, which I think is a great complement to the PCI report, um, that SOC 2 Type 2, you should, you should receive the entire report, not just the cover page. That report will include more detail or should include more detail about the controls that they've actually implemented, and it can be hugely valuable to you. And then in addition to that, if they have penetration tests that they will share with you, if they're willing to share with you their penetration tests and you go through and you understand the scope of those tests and they are adequate and, um, and thorough, that can also give you a very solid sense of uh, confidence that they have their security controls in place. Um, of course, they may have remediation items, and so making sure that they follow up and track those items to closure is also very important. Excellent. And Dustin, I'll ask uh, you to get into your final thoughts as well. Yeah, thank you. So, so I would just mention that uh, there are many advantages out there to, to, to the different cloud services and cloud providers out there. There's a reason why it seems like the world is moving to the cloud. 
um, I would just reaffirm the importance to understand what what your provider, your potential provider, uh, is responsible for, and, and fully vet them. Uh, also, don't don't confuse security and compliance. Uh, these are they're two related but distinctly different um, areas. Uh, and in in as an organization, you should have a list of what you require from a security perspective and from a compliance perspective, and then verify whatever provider you utilize or potential provider that they're addressing both those security and compliance needs. So again, just make sure you do your due diligence and uh, and and find a, a great provider to help you out there to, to and a, a good provider is gonna help you meet these compliance uh, requirements and help your organization. So just do your best um, to, to find that provider that's gonna best meet your needs and take advantage of that. And uh, I, I, I've seen great things out there with, with these different cloud services to help organizations that otherwise would have a difficult time meeting a lot of the compliance burden or, or requirements. So uh, it, it's a good thing. That, and uh, we just need to make sure we, 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 we fully vet and do our due diligence when engaging with these providers. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dustin. So I see a lot of great questions rolling in. Um, let's go ahead and dive right into our Q&A session. Just a, uh, a reminder to our attendees, go ahead and submit any questions uh, through your Q&A widget that you see in the platform here. Um, and let's get right into it. I see a, a number of great questions. Um, I'll do my best to field to the appropriate presenter here. Um, Susan, let's go ahead and, and start with you. When it comes to Snowflake being PCI accredited, is that an out of the box uh, or will it require some configuration on, on their side? That's actually a great question. Um, so specific to Snowflake, out of the box we provide a tremendous amount of uh, controls that address PCI requirements. Um, we are PCI accredited or certified, and so um, the, the entire platform is already PCI compliant. What you as a customer need to enable, again, um, are documented in the PCI um, responsibility matrix, which we are happy to share with you. There we enable by default end-to-end -end encryption, for example, and uh, we provide uh, very substantive functionality to make the user management and role-based access control easier. And we also provide audit logs, again, so that you guys can understand what, um, what access you have, which is another uh, important piece of PCI compliance. Um, and we perform penetration testing on our environment. So those are some of the things that, uh, that, that we provide. And from the customer's perspective, again, it's going to be the obvious things like endpoint protection and end user education and everything that happens outside of the Snowflake application. Um, a couple of the other key pieces of functionality to, to consider implementing are, of course, IP whitelisting and either federated authentication and or at least multi-factor authentication. Um, we actually have documented publicly how you would uh, enable that within Snowflake. So you can do a search of our documentation. And again, um, I believe my contact information will be displayed at the end of this and provided to you. So you are welcome to contact me for more specific details if you have more questions. Great, thanks Susan. Um, Dustin, this next one looks um, like a good one for you. What should I ask from my provider for validation of compliance, just kind of following on what Susan was chatting about? Yeah, no, Melanie, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, it seems simple, but uh, a lot of people struggle with this. So I sometimes see organizations passing certificates or, or letters out there stating they're compliant or just pointing to the, the, the visa maintains a list of compliance service providers and sometimes uh, provi or organizations will just point to their listing on the visa side. The PCI Council is pretty clear on this. That what you should be asking for is the actual attestation of compliance 
It's referred to as the AOC, and there's a reason for this. So the AOC includes details around scoping and services that were included as part of the assessment and what services the organization has that maybe was not included. So this is important information for you based on what we talked about today. It's for you to determine where, where your specific services um, assessed by this third party assessor and, and determine compliant. So I re recommend you review your provider's AOC and, and also ask them for that responsibility matrix if they have one. Uh, both those documents together are going to be very important for you to determine uh, not only their compliance status, but uh, what you're responsible for as well. All right. Thanks, Justin. Um, Susan, here's a great one for you. What is different about Snowflake versus other SaaS providers when it comes to making my life easier? Yeah, so uh, th this gives me a great opportunity, I guess, to kind of brag again about Snowflake. Um, we do provide encryption right out of the box, and we try to make it as easy as possible for our customers to connect their secure environment to our secure environment. Um, there are uh, a few other pieces of functionality. We have something called time travel, which provides the ability to um, to actually go back in time, this addresses a lot of the backup requirements. The backups are actually accessible at all times by the customer, and therefore they're able to do their own restores. And because it's right within the Snowflake Flake environment, the backups are encrypted at all times as well. So um, that, and then I also mentioned earlier, of course, the, the role-based access control, the discretionary access control, but that functionality is built into the Snowflake application and can be implemented very easily. There's great detailed documentation on our public website about how you would implement that. And then um, the audit logs, again, I can't emphasize enough how important it is from a forensic perspective that you have audit logs and that you have an understanding of who's accessing what and being able to go back and see, you know, was there, when you go through and you do your user reviews, right, this is an environment that you're going to have to look at to ensure that only those users who have the requirement for their job duties have access to the sensitive information. This will give you another layer of reinforcement that that's happening. Um, and then I think... Probably another differentiator, quite honestly, is that we do share our penetration test reports um, and our uh, full SOC 2 report, obviously our attestation of compliance report. We work very closely with our customers to make sure that they're very comfortable with our security solution. And um, any suggestions, we obviously take suggestions from our customers. We welcome them on how we can improve our security. Um, we want it to be a partnership. A lot of our customers are so smart. We want to be able to leverage their experience. Um, so I think from our perspective, it's probably a pretty significant degree of transparency um, makes us a little bit different. All right. Thanks, Susan. Um, Dustin, here is a really good question. What happens if I fail my PCI audit, PCI audit, or really any audit for that matter? Wow. So, so yeah, that's a good question. It's also a tough question. So, so it really <laughs> depends. It's kind of it. It depends type answer. So it really depends on on why you are going through the compliance validation and who is re requiring this of you. Of course, if you're failing an assessment, there are probably controls that you want to address immediately, uh, go through a remediation plan. Uh, but typically, you will, you'll be reporting to either the card brands or, or an acquiring bank. And if so, um, they, you will work with them um, to, to go through that process of defining a remediation plan and, and addressing the issues that caused you to fail. So the council, they actually have a document. It's called the Prioritized Approach Spreadsheet, and many people out there may be familiar with that. But typically, if, if you go through an assessment and, and are determined noncompliant, uh, they will want you to, to complete that Prioritized Approach document. It will want you to define, really, that you have a project plan and what your timeline is for addressing the issues. 
that were non-compliant. And ultimately, it's going to be up to the, the card brands or, or the acquiring bank to determine what the consequences are for, for not being compliant. Uh, typically, they'll give you some period of time to work with you as long as you're moving forward through that timeline and that project plan. Uh, but that's all going to be deter determined on what the, you know, how large the scope is and what the risk and, and liability is associated with this non-compliance or non-compliant environment. So uh, they, they will ultimately be the ones to answer that question. Okay. And, and perhaps maybe this should have been sort of an earlier question, but let's talk about major security breaches and, and what happens in the event of a major security breach, Dustin, from your perspective. Yeah, so you bring up that, – that, that's a really uh, good question as well. Um, it's one we probably we should it, should it no it, it's it's actually really good I probably should have spoke a little about this previously when we were talking about responsibilities so um, part one of the requirements is that you maintain your incident response plan um, if there ever was an event that you follow that plan um, and that includes specific requirements to follow the the card brand reporting requirements should be incorporated into that. Um, Within the industry, there's what's called a PFI, and that's a PCI forensic investigator. And typically, when there's a suspected breach, the acquiring banks and the card brands get involved, and they typically will want a PFI um, deployed to investigate that environment uh, as soon as possible. And that that, sh the, that process should be built into your incident response plan. So what happens, the question is, what happens if you're using a service provider and all your data is located somewhere else? How is that being facilitated? Well, part of your, your due diligence process should be asking those questions and making sure uh, these type of requirements or process, procedures can be met. So how, how will a PFI get access to that environment and that data? And will they have access? Um, and will they will you be able to meet the the card brand card brands and sit response procedures? Uh, that's that's something you'll need to determine and, and verify that your provider is allowing a way for that to be met. Um, sometimes it won't be as you know as typical as a physical environment. There's things they have to do within a cloud that are a little different. The type of data they work with, but but. There, there need, you need a way to facilitate that to make sure they get what they need to perform an investigation if required. Um, so there's always risk if, if those requirements can't be met that they could deem you as non-compliant just on that fact alone that they can't perform a forensic and you want to avoid that. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I, th I think that's that's great. Thank you very much. So, Susan, um, we we have – more of a, a functional uh, related question to Snowflake. Um, and it, it's asking about touching base on the ingestion consideration, data ingestion consideration for cloud. Right. Can you speak a little bit to that? Right, yeah. I think that um, I'm not sure 100% what this specific question is, is getting to, but I know from a data ingestion perspective, Snowflake has a few methods that you can use to bring data into the data warehouse. Um, so we have connectors that we use. So we support a variety of connectors that uh, our customers use to, uh, to take the data from their existing format and to pull it into the Snowflake environment. It can be structured or unstructured. And of course, as with everything, it is encrypted at all times. So your, your PCI compliance in that case is maintained. Um, so I'm not sure that that really answers that question. We could go down a number of different paths. So um, I think there's more information available in our partner environment. And so uh, there are probably tools that are available that our partners can look at if that is an applicable uh, circumstance for the person who is asking that question. Perfect. So I think um, uh, let's go ahead and, and wrap up just a few minutes early. Um, I want to thank our presenters, Dustin Rich from Align, of course, Susan Walsh from Snowflake. I uh, hope this presentation was informative and productive for everyone. 
Uh, thank you so much. We'll go ahead and, and wrap up, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you so much. Thanks, you guys. Yep. Thanks, everyone.